go, hey. Got me started. Wrist frames, card. Okay. Pull up, double park. Don't even pay like I'm the owner. My young niggas too tardy. Yo, what up, guys? We're on the clock. It's Caleb back again with Julian. Welcome to the madness. How are we doing, Julian? It's good to see you. Brother, I lost my board. What? I'm fucking disappointed. Bro, where are you? Uh, I'm... I feel like I'm hearing you really clearly or something. Like, it's something's a little different. Like, where are you at, bro? Dude, I got lost. I'm in this random-ass hotel room in, like, Bumblefuck, Ohio. Bro, I'm in Ohio. You're in Ohio? Hold up. More up. <laughs> <laughs> Leave this one, bro. You're right here. Oh. Oh. Okay. This is a switch of a pace, ain't it, ladies and gentlemen? We got Julian Mendelson, Caleb Miller in the flesh, living, breathing. On the clock, finally, live and in person, the way it was born to be. And we're here, first time ever. And we're here to bring you the first week of Six Month Madness for this season, live and in person. If you've been here before, you know how it goes. You know how we start. I'm going to rattle off our top 32 teams in the country. Of course, we despise the AP top 25 because it's garbage. It's never right. Yeah, never right. Jesus, this is such a real dude. One of these it's crazy. It's weird, like looking at you and like realizing that, like, I could just smack you in the head. <laughs> yeah, I know. Now, I, now you don't have to put up with my BS over a, a Zoom call. Um, but jokes aside, jokes aside, uh, I know that you weren't joking. <laughs> um, we got UConn, the defending champs, at number one. Uh, we got Arizona at two. Uh, both those teams are sitting at two and oh. The first six are sitting at two and oh. I'm gonna move through them quickly. We've got UConn at one, Arizona at two, Baylor at three, Kansas at four, Kentucky at five, Houston at six. Um, those are the current 2-0 teams that we believe are the top six teams in the country. Uh, obviously, Arizona got a big win um, that we'll talk about later on at Duke. Um, Auburn has a re or Baylor has a, a resume win over Auburn. Um, and then kind of rallying through the rest. Duke at seven, obviously losing um you know to the number two team in our rankings number two team in the country um as we're going to refer to it all year if you don't like it then go listen to somebody else's college basketball podcast where they're sheep and follow the ap top 25 because we're not going to we're not sheep we're not sheep virginia at eight usc at nine marquette at 10 illinois at 11 alabama 12 north carolina 13 gonzaga 14 creighton 15 arkansas 16 ucla 17 purdue 18 tennessee 19 Providence 20, FAU 21, Texas A&M 22, Miami 23, Villanova 24, Texas 25, Iowa State 26, BYU 27 with a big win over San Diego State. Um, 28, we have Ohio State at 1-1, one and one. Um, Michigan State at 1-1 one and one at 29 as well. Only three teams with the loss in our top 32. And then kind of the, the stragglers there at the end, we got Georgia, or we got Oregon with a big win over Georgia. St. Mary's with a win over New Mexico, who will probably have a bounce back rest of their year. We anticipate them being good. So we think that's a good resume win. And we have a team that, you know, pulled off probably the biggest upset, if, you know, definitively the biggest upset of the season so far, with James Madison coming in at 32, um, at 2-0, and um, the W against Michigan State at a neutral site. Um, you know, a, a unique feature before we get into it, I think, you know, James Mastin's a great way to segue into the, you know, the first talking point that we're going to have for this podcast. Um, something unique this week that we're going to lead with is obviously we just went to a college basketball game for the we first did. time together. Um, we saw Kent State versus Fresno State, um, and it was a great game. And, you know, James Mastin had a win over Kent State as well recently in a double overtime victory. You know, Kent State's a great ball club. We'll get into it shortly. Um, you know, a unique feature, like I was mentioning, is that I'll be posting and writing an article to accompany this podcast. It'll be uploaded to our Twitter and it'll be through Substack. So make sure to go give the Substack a follow and, uh, you know, make sure to keep tabs on the six month madness Twitter is that's is that will be the primary source of how we're going to be posting these podcasts going forward. Normally I would tweet things via the on the clock basketball, but we're going to start giving the six month madness feed, um, some of its own love and keep the um you know the film work 
um, and you know other anecdotal BS that I tweet about um, on the on the clock feed. There's a lot of that, so we'll clean up those feeds for you um, and make sure you can just keep, stay locked into the Six Month Madness podcast as its own entity uh, on the Six Month Madness basketball Twitter. Um, getting right into it, um, Kent State versus Fresno State, um, and what are kind of our feelings? Re- you know, walking away from that game, obviously. Fresno State um, is kind of who we were pulling for for reasons that don't need to be stated. But uh, very you know, badly, I might add. Uh, yes, I was very vocal. <laughs> we, were, we were the only we people. We were the only people cheering for Fresno, Fresno State, State in the entire building. Um, and you know, not necessarily a packed house for a season home opener. Um, you know, not really what you'd expect. Um, attendance wise, I was expecting a little bit more of a tightly packed house and a little bit more energy. Yeah. But um, Kent State was still able to ride what energy was there. Um, you know, a great game from um, Jalen Solinger. Yeah, Jalen Solinger was great. <clears throat> uh, Giovanni Santiago didn't have a great night, but he's been a solid player for Kent State. Um, you know, big time shot making from Patton and um, um, geez, what's I we need the roster Bass? Yeah, Bass, Bass was, was a great really game. good. Uh, well, he, he got injured though. Yeah, he had, he had an injury briefly. Um, and I mean, you know, I'm gonna get the Gatorade because this is gonna be a long one, but. Um, you know, it's kind of looking at the roster sheet, just so many good Rollins had a great night. Uh, yeah. Von Cameron Davis had some big, big, uh, big moments late. Um, but I think the moral of the story, uh, for me was, is I found a player that I'm going to watch all year. Cause you know me, I love my freshman Isaac Tavares, phenomenal. um, had a phenomenal night. For you know, Fresno State. It's funny. He wasn't really supposed to play that. Mm-mm. I think so. I, what would happen? He played is, three minutes in their opener against nobody, um, Fresno State Central or something like that. Yeah. So, so I mean, what I at least the gauge that I got for why I played so much, their third on guys we, was we kind of realized um, before the night, and Leo Comerio with about two minutes into the second half gets his fourth foul, mm-hmm. and they kind of just threw Tavares into the fire, and he and, played great. He was phenomenal. I mean, high energy on both ends. Nasty, nasty finisher around the rim. Mm-hmm. Had he some really nice zero. steps. And he had a, had a nice fast break finish at the end. I'll probably pop up on Twitter. I'll probably make an edit of him later tonight. Yeah. Um, with some other guys that we're able to watch here later on in the night. Just finished watching Bradley. Um, you know, a team that's sneakily outside of our our top thirty two. That you guys that will that will be uh shoving your guys and down your guys' throat. Pause. Um. Xavier Dussel, great player. Um, I don't know if you if you actually looked at the box score, but had 18 on on what's felt like a quiet night for both of us. Um, I don't know. Fun, fun game. Um, you know, maybe not as close as we were hoping. Um, but that Kent State squad can really hoop. And I'm not can score, man. I'm yeah. not surprised they pushed a really, really good James Madison team to two overtimes. I mean, if you really look at it, Kent State's a team that, you know, could be on par with the Michigan State at the end of the day. And <laughs> oh, I'm glad we got that joke. We've got a we got a conspiracy going on the top is a intent Tom is intentionally sandbag this game to uh boost James Madison so yeah. that you know he's got he a looks, top 32 loss. He does, he does. And and they look like they have a a, a more reputable um, you know, schedule early. And I think it was strictly for the reason to make it still under our top, you know, 32. Cause if, if they wouldn't have beaten James, Ma- if they would have beat James Madison, I don't know if they would have made it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gaslighting. I'm gaslighting. Yeah, it's just good to be in person and uh, recording a pod. We had a, we've had a great time uh, this weekend um, here in uh, Ken, Ohio. Um, don't want to say anything bad about Ohio. Um, you know, I'm from the Midwest. I understand what Midwest looking places look like. Um, you know, Julian's a coastie, so he he doesn't really get the get the the fields and woods flavor. But um, you know, it's it's all right here. Um, but you know, moving on to bigger and better things. Um, unless you had any other notes. I thought Tobias Dussel was the main notes. The jump uh someone's a crazy good. shot. Yeah, that that I honestly, I mean, at the end of the day, like it was just a matter of turnovers. I mean, we talked about all we're watching mm-hmm. the game. It's Fresno State shot better, and re- rebounded, rebounded a bit them. better, and had uh, more assists at the end of the game. Maybe um, I think it was close, it was close but they were they were they out were out assisting. They had like it was like they had eleven assists and Kent State had like seven, 
with like there's a lot of like ISO 10 ball. minutes left it's a lot of ISO ball. a lot of ISO ball between both teams but I mean Fresno State just couldn't get a like legitimate post touch I don't know why they're going to it um you know this is this is this is a Kent State team that really struggled um to defend on the perimeter and stop really really good shooting teams and the reality is is that this Fresno State team is not a shooting team I, they got to run through Dussel more, man. Yeah, they I agree. To. The offense has to go through him. And I'm sure Dussel will have a mention in our next section at some point this year. Um, if you're, again, if you're not familiar, you're going you're gonna to catch up quickly. Top mid-major performers, you know me, I'm a deep cuts guy. Um, I like to stay in the deep end in the prospect world. Um, yeah, and um, it is my pleasure to open the season discussing who I think is going to be an NBA draft pick. I agree. At, at the end of this season, um, we'll be talking about him in June. Um, Brandon Johnson for East Carolina opened with, um, you know, 29 points against Ferrum, which, you know, is nothing notable. Um, 13 points against Campbell in their second game, um, shooting six for 12 from three. But I didn't post, I didn't put the other stat lines on my note sheet because I just don't think it needs to be stated in box score fashion at this point in the year. They played so limited games, not great um, opponents. We'll talk about somebody from Campbell in a second. But the thing with Brandon Johnson is he's just a pro, like rebounds yeah, the ball really well, uh, plays his size. A lot of guys at 6'8 at the college level sometimes shy away from contact, especially when they're more geared towards the perimeter offensively. Um, I just want to make sure I'm still in the frame, but offensively, yeah, yeah I'm well within the frame. Um, like offensively um, and defensively, uses his body well, um, utilizes his sides to create mismatches, especially driving to the basket. Exciting prospect, in my opinion. Yeah, the thing I want to note, because I was watching a bit of it today from the hour of two to three, um, he didn't have like his best scoring night. You know, it's a scoring night. I say, like, he played at 10 p.m. He didn't have his best scoring day today. But if you just watch the way he moves the ball, the way he gets in position to do the right things on both ends of the court, that's what really stood out to me, the way he's – how quickly he swings the ball and makes reads. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you can tell that he processes the game at a really, really high level. And we've seen, you know, from last year what his shot-making ability is. We know – that he is able to score at a high level. So I, I think and the NBA range. Exactly. He has consistent, that's, that's he has consistent too. NBA range. Um put it on full display against Ferrum, had two or three shots that are from 27 feet plus. Um, so exciting stuff for him. Uh, moving on, Anthony Del Warsaw is a big guy of Julian's preseason, and I've guy. definitely hopped on the train. Um 35 points against East Carolina. <laughs> Uh, today, obviously, I'm going to mention, again, we're recording this on Saturday, November 11th, um, following the Kent State-Fresno State basketball game that took place at 7 p.m., ended at about 9. So, um, you know, we got some grub in the background that we'll be much on later, um, but wanted to bring this pod to you guys. Yeah, I can smell it. It's just, it just smells so good. But um, Anthony Del Orso, um Four for eight from three, had 14 points in their opener against Navy. Um, and I made a little edit on Twitter. He's just so smooth, can do everything, so can do everything scoring wise. Um, the only thing I can really harp on his game for is he, I think he's only got two assists across two games against, you know, ECU is not a lackluster opponent. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be a yeah. team in contention at some point. But Navy without um, you know, really any form of um, you know, strong weapon. Um, you know, nobody that's really notable on the defensive end. So it's, to me, it's kind of a, a red flag that he's not getting that many assists, but I don't, I don't think it matters because I think they just want him to put the ball in hoop. After watching the game against East Carolina today, I don't think it's quite that simple. Um, Let's hear it. He's, he's dishing, he's doing his thing. He does not quite have the supporting cast that one would hope that a guy <laughs> like Anthony Dell or so of his caliber would have. Um, I'm a bit concerned with the defense. Um, he looks like he's a bit slow on that end, and that's a bit unnerving to me. Uh, but honestly, like guarding the perimeter, I like they were kind of running a zone against ECU today, and like he was making a lot of the right reads in the zone. So I think yeah, his his way is to kind of just get better at cutting off angles on drives, and I think he's capable of doing that. But offensively, I think he's complete. I mean, three level scorer. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to disrespect his playmaking by any means. He's just no. not, he's not creating baskets, I guess is what I'm saying. That into no, he's, and- he's solid. He's complete um, in terms of the fact that he's able to pass, dribble, shoot. Um, he's able to pass out of drives. He's not taking bad shots, clearly. And and he's not, you know, digging himself a hole by not finding teammates. I just don't think he's he's like a premier playmaker. No, and, and like, I, but I do think, I do think after watching him play today that the assist numbers are a little bit deflated because I do think he's creating good looks that like probably would result in a few more assists. I don't think he's premier, but I think he's a better playmaker than the numbers give him credit for. I was busy at the middle of the day today. So, yeah. um, you know, you were able to watch, watch the, the Campbell game and fill me in, but um. Uh, I'll move on unless you had any. I think Dolores is great. We'll keep an eye on him for the rest of the year. He'll probably have another appearance in this segment at some point. Yeah, I mean, look, Campbell's not the best team in the world, and I think ECU was a lot better. But, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Campbell makes a, a run at the big yeah. this year because of him. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think I think they're one of the better teams in their conference. Um, Elias Jones for UTEP. This is more of an analytical um, you know, pop starting this season 16 for 17 on field goals. It's for six foot eight sophomore forward for for UTEP. Um, like I mentioned, um, can shoot it from three. Um, you know, the one miss is from three, so he's perfect inside the arc. Um, has a nice little mid range shot. Um, gets to his spots pretty well. Um, I don't know. Somebody's been doing that at the door a bunch lately. Did you notice it last night? No, no, it was weird. Oh, like the, you. Uh, yeah, you were, you died. Um, the snort apparently. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, I don't really have anything else. I think Elijah Jones is a player to watch if you have a chance. He was just a reason to watch a Utah game. Yeah, I, which I, is really what the end of the day is. Uh, this is what this segment's about: is to get people interested and invested in players other than power five teams. I mean, we have a conference that we previewed with two players that are notable that we're about to talk about. Mm-hmm. I didn't get a chance to watch UTEP, but we did get to watch uh, a certain Bradley team play tonight with uh, a certain player that we've talked about a few times going into the season, Malevi Leons. Yeah, Malevi um, Leons, huge uh, opener against UAB. Um, in my opinion, that's a huge win. And I think that, you know, that's another reason, you know, obviously a- UAB's got Eric Gaines. Yeah, they and- still got him alone the fact that Malevi Leons was guarding Eric Gaines the entire game. I told you, I told you, man, at, at, at the end of the season last year, when they played Drake in the uh, MVC championship, he was guarding DeVries the whole game. DeVries had one of his worst games of his career. Yeah. And DeVries put up 36 in the opener of the season. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're going to hammer DeVries a lot this year. Um, just a prolific score uh, for Drake. Uh, had 36 in their season over, like we mentioned, is going to follow up with, I'm sure, plenty of other 30-point games the rest of the year. Okay. Um, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about him. Just a complete scorer. If you haven't watched Drake and Tucker to Breeves, just make the time to do it. Um, you won't regret it. Back to Melody Leons. Obviously, had 24-12 and four steals and blocks uh, versus UAB in their opener. Um, big win in overtime against Utah, or, uh, Utah State, like we just watched, who has a guy that I love in Nigel Burris. Um, so he didn't really get a lot of tick at the end of the game, but I mean, that's the story of his NCAA career so far. Yeah, so, uh, um, it is, it is a complete defender, um, in Malavi Leons and, um, yeah, up, has, yeah. has turned into a phenomenal offensive player. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's really flourished. He was, he was a high impact player tonight. I mean, we saw, he had a game tonight, so obviously we didn't have enough time to pop in the stats, but we got him after the game. Um, he had nine, nine points, nine, nine rebounds. I think it was seven assists and five steals tonight. It was five assists, five steals. You're right. Five assists, five steals. Um, but I mean, at the end of the game, we watched him hit an assist for a three win it to seal it to steal it it. then on the ensuing possession he got the defensive rebound and drilled two free throws to fully ice the game i mean just a winning player making winning plays had a good close out and then got the rebound and then got fouled fouled look uh, that's it if there's any way any like stretch of possessions that i would use to sum up 11 without scoring without scoring a field goal yep Impacted the game on both ends of the floor. I mean, that's that's what you. I'm so excited to watch that, like Bradley Drake, him and Tucker matchup this year. 
It's going to be so prime, much fun. Prime, it's going to be so much fun. Prime time TV. A hundred percent. Both of them are must watch TV in my opinion. Uh, James Edwards Jr. Speaking of must watch TV for James Madison. We mentioned them before coming in at number 32. Um what else can we say? 24 points in the upset over Michigan State in, in overtime uh, in their opener, and then followed it up with a 25 10 and 6 game against Kent State in a double overtime win. Kid is just a bucket, um, you know, uh, has good size. I think this is more for the draft heads. And I think, uh, you know, Max, shout out to Maxwell Baumbach, you know, the crystal ball. Um, you know, he was seen and do it very well before that game against Michigan State and said he would be an impact player. And he was and was somebody I was looking for from the onset and was not disappointed. Um, you know, starting the season with 49 points um, in a lot of minutes, obviously. Um, but, you know, no slouch to him. He's been a great player. Um, He's doing and, it against good competition, too. Yeah. I mean, that's what you want to see early in the season is good players doing it against other, you know, Real competition. A lot of these games early in the season have been tough. Tough. Um, at least from like as quality some, basketball. Exactly. Like as someone who likes to watch like good basketball games where there's two teams that are like competitive against mm-hmm. each other, it has been tough to find those games. See, I don't mind dipping down in the mid majors during the like conference schedule is because they're equally matched teams. Like exactly. we're talking about teams that have played against each other, coaches that know each other. Um, and know each other's schemes and, and and have prepared to play against these teams through the offseason. You know, our recruiting players compete against XYZ player, recruiting this big man to stop this big man in the conference, bringing in a transfer player uh, to off their veteranship because they know that they can contend. Um, and then, you know, that forces the 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 uh, onus on other teams. Um, and I, th- I love that inner political, um, you know, discourse between college basketball teams within the conference. And it's just hard to watch games that are not that competitive. Um, yeah. And especially when teams are sloppy. I mean, the Arizona Duke game was great, but I mean, I would almost rather have that game somehow get slapped on the end of the schedule. And both these teams are in their peak powers, but I'm, I'm glad we got it though. It's a good measuring. No, I like, I like the early season measuring stick games. I think yeah, fair enough. you can't put too much stock into them um when it comes to march i don't think it's like necessary like i it, they're completely different teams right now. yeah i mean the ap poll people and the bracketology people are all going to talk about it on shows about you know arizona's huge win against duke at the beginning of the year but i just yeah, don't think the duke team that they're playing right now is going to be the duke team that they're going to play at the end of the year if they face them again because sean stewart's going to play more throughout the year yeah hale foster's going to play more throughout the year tj power is going to play more throughout the year um yeah you know, we, i, I want to talk about that dude game at some point because i have a few pretty we don't have a, we don't have a recap segment um you know for the whole for our uh you know top five games from the week before because obviously we didn't have a week before instead you know when we talked about the game that we just went to um but we will make time at the end to maybe talk about um the duke game as we're talking about some of the games coming up for next week. I want to keep it moving, though. Actually, we'll have a great chance because we'll talk about Tyrus Proctor in a moment. moment. Aiden Mahaney, I have um, one thing, one word, actually, um, in the notes. Bucket. He's so good, man. Um, Aiden Mahaney, sophomore guard for St. Mary's, um, was a player I was relatively early on last year. Um, and I think he's going to be a pro um, at some point and definitely a guy that you should watch out for, for all American. I, I, I just, I don't have much to say. I think that you just have to go watch it yourself. Um, complete combo guard. I mean, if, if you like, if you've watched Anthony Del Orso, then you would literally dream of Aiden Mahaney um, and the things that he can do yeah. on the court, a leader for that St. Mary's team. Um, that you know obviously um, was in our top 32 at number 31 just ahead of James Madison um, so yeah fun stuff um, you know he'll definitely make his way you know WCC is not necessarily a mid-major conference um, but it is qualified by most people so it gives me an excuse to talk about eight Mahaney once a week if I want to yeah um, stocks on the rise this is the segment where we go through um, some players that are notable draft prospects and maybe even some sleeper guys 
um, but generally going to be geared towards freshmen at Power Five conferences, sophomores at Power Five conference schools, um, and you know guys who are generally making their way um, through draft conversations, whether it's through last year um, or I mean most of the discourses on Twitter. So if you're tapped in on Twitter, you won't be surprised by any of these names. Um, Jacoby Walter um, for Baylor had a crazy 28 point opener versus Auburn struggled in the second game, maybe has some signs of being a streaky player only at seven points on, uh, I think it was, uh, three of, um, seven or three of nine shooting, um, in the second game against a lesser opponent. Um, so I don't know what that maybe says about him as a player, but I think the tools, the shot makings there, the off the dribble stuff is awesome. Um, really looks like he can score from an NBA uh, three-point line off the dribble. And I think that that's something alone is something to invest in, invest in. But then you get to the other side of the ball, which is where, you know, there's real stock in him becoming, um, you know, a guy who should be in top 10 conversations maybe at some point during the year. I don't know if you'd get me there. I think you could maybe get me to late lottery just outside the lottery. Um but that's just because I don't like shot creators. Julian is more invested than I am. Yeah, I mean, I think the off the dribble stuff is like this early. I mean, look, it's going to be streaky, mm-hmm. right? Remember, he's a freshman going to a big golf team. Um, so, you know, we're not expecting him to put up 20-point game after 20-point game, mm-hmm. you know, off the bat. But the amount of flashes that he showed, I would I would consider game one like a very, very large flash. Mm -hmm. right where it's like okay like if this guy can you know do this on a semi-consistent basis at an nba level he can do it he can do what he's doing at an nba level Mm -hmm. it's for him at this point it's purely about consistency because and can he carry this type of energy and performances into conference play i think he can i i think he can too i'm not concerned about that that's why he's leading this segment i don't think I, i think it'd be hard to talk about anybody um because I think he went from somebody who I don't know, maybe is maybe he's a late pick in the first round on people that are high on him, um, and then for others that are really high on him, have probably had him top ten or higher. I and, um, and, and I think and I think that this is this last um, you know week for him, um, you know, brought that that median up a bit in towards the lottery. I I have him firmly in my lottery, honestly. I think he'll fall there for me. Um, I just want to see more. I agree. I, I want to see it. And not just, not just more in a sense of um, watch him play basketball more. I want to see more games like the Auburn game, because if he has more games like that, where he's able to impact the game um, at such a high level scoring the ball and still able to keep up on the defensive end, like he was against Auburn. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty high on him. as like most people. I think at some point, if he's doing that consistently, it'll be hard for people to uh, pass up on him. Speaking of somebody who's making it hard for people to pass up on him, um, Tyrese Proctor stunned me with his ability to pass the ball. He's um, been ridiculously, ridiculously playmaking. Um, and it's not that he couldn't make the reads last year and couldn't make some great passes. He had some nice flashes of playmaking throughout the year. Um, he's just now doing it with consistency, without mistakes. Um and with comfortability. Yeah. And yeah. and he's then now translating some of that in between stuff into shot making. I mean, he looks effortless out there. Mm-hmm. Purely effortless. I mean, whether it's off the dribble pull ups, whether it's reads in the pick and roll, I mean, he's making Kyle Filipowski look like a superstar. Yeah. And Kyle Filipowski is a great player. This is not me trying to shade Kyle Filipowski to credit Tyrese Proctor. I just want to like, Part of the reason that Filipowski has been able to be so great is because he has a guard who is just one of the best guard, if not the best guard in the country, I think right now. Um, I, It's pretty hard pressed for me to say that there's many guards in the country who are going to be better than Tyrus Proctor this year. And if Duke is going to do anything in the tournament, if, I mean, we, we talked about, uh, we talked about, you know, Filipowski, just a second ago in Duke in general, but it's going to be those two guys, you know? Yeah. I think, I think Phil Powski in college basketball terms is a superstar. Um, and I think that he'll still be um, a lottery type pick. Um, 
if he has a huge year, especially shooting the ball, which he looks like he's made improvements to his game. I think Filipowski can make a case for that because he is a, a big forward. And he probably, if he declared last year, could have made a case for himself as a first round pick. Um, <clears throat> so I think with the returning year, I think the key thing is that a player like Filipowski can elevate the stock of a guy like Proctor because he can show what it's like. If you give this guy a big man who can score it, at all three levels can and score off the roll, can score off the pop. Um, and you surround him with talent like Duke has. Um, you know, even though they were a little shaky to start, I thought that they still were hung in there with Arizona, who's a veteran team. I mean, I you're so. talking about Omar Bala. You're talking about um, he loved, no, no he loves Cameron Arena. He loves Cameron. He was, he was thrilled. I, I also do think it's kind of a mutual beneficial thing. Um, because, you know, uh, you need guards who can get you the ball, you know, sometimes. Yeah, it's going to help Filipowski's stock, and it's going to help Proctor's stock. Um, you know, it's just a – it's an interesting, um, you know, outcome for them, I think, you know, losing to Arizona. I think a lot of people probably anticipated them winning that game because they looked so dominant against Dartmouth. But it's against Dartmouth. So I lost by, like, 40. Yeah. I forget who, but – um speaking of um a team that has not already <laughs> <laughs> a team that, is not, that was terrible I, i'm better with these transitions I've, I've been doing a little editing here just making sure our notes are nice and refined um because i do have ocd about some of this stuff let's uh, go instead of ocd let's go icc talk about <laughs> Trevon in brazil yeah nailed it baby uh 23 points 13 boards and five blocks through two games. Um, those aren't, you know, gaudy numbers, especially against, you know, not maybe the best competition like we've been talking about, but shooting two for three from three, similar start like he had last year. Um, and now, you know, we talked about him in this segment last year. Yeah. At this time at the end, we won. We talked about so um, the body he caught. And uh, then I think it was week two that he got injured. Yeah. Um, I so. I think the big thing that's all I have to say. The big reason that that I think Trevon Brazil was on here is because we saw so much potential from him last year. And it like a lot of times you'll see guys kind of take their time getting up to speed, at least from you know the athletic perspective and kind of what we've got at least six dunks. Yeah, we've kind of seen a lot of the same stuff that we saw from him starting last year. Yeah, I know it's ridiculous. So like that that gives me a lot of optimism that like. This year, you know, like I said, knock on the wood, he stays healthy. Like, he'll have that breakout and really be able to elevate his game like we thought he was going to be able to last year with a full healthy season. Yeah. You know? I couldn't agree more. John Stevenson and Grant Nelson for Alabama, starting with Stevenson, a freshman, um, has 22, eight, two steals and blocks in 39 minutes through two games so far this year. Three for seven from three. Keep it short and sweet. Um, I don't know if you got to catch much, Jaron. Um, just looks like a really smooth off-ball player. Uh, reminds me a little bit of Noah Clowney, but more perimeter-oriented. Um, I think he'll have a really big year for an Alabama team um, that needs that type of second punch um, and moments. Rylan Griffin just doesn't look like he's going to be that, no, they, unfortunately. They need size as well. um, and they need size. And I think that they have some good, stable big men, but nobody who can step out and shoot the ball. And I think that that gives Grant Nelson, um, who had 44 points, 15 rebounds, three assists, and six steals and blocks in 54 minutes through two games so far, you know, doubling, near, nearly doubling all of Jaron's statistics, um, uh, you know, only in um, 15 more minutes. Um, and the higher usage. The higher usage. And I think Grant Nelson looks great at six foot 11, as six foot 10, six foot 11, kind of tweener. Um, you know, a little bit of a thinner frame, but looks like he's had some muscle onto it. I think, you know, a lot of people were put on to him last year, late in the year. Uh, shout out KJ Pistons and Pistons Draft Talk. If you guys draft work, they definitely put a lot of people on to him, me and myself included, um, at the end of the season there. Um, highly talented player from North Dakota State. Um, if you haven't been able to watch him, uh, don't be fooled by the appearance. He will dunk on your favorite player. Yeah, man, he can get off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I do kind of want to see uh, what Bama and, you know, those two guys specifically look like against a capable team. 
Um, that's Especially my... Grant Nelson. Yeah. I just want to see what he looks like through a whole course of SDC competition. That's that's my only real criticism of the guys. Like they're because he's still well. playing the same teams that he was playing against at North Dakota State. State. Yeah, hundred percent. And and that's the biggest thing. And he was dominating those teams last year. So it's like, of course, he's gonna step in and dominate teams this year. Speaking of a guy who's dominating but hasn't played competition at quite the level that he's played at. Um, Milan Monsilovic looks phenomenal. I'm going to pat myself on the back. That was good. I'm going to pat myself on the back. No, I'm going to, I'm going to pat myself on the back just for the Milan factor. Um, coming out, coming out of Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Uh Um, I tried to put people on. I tried to tell them we talked about in the John Lovelace pod on the John Lovelace video. You can go check it out. We talked about him. Me and John talked about him. I'd mentioned, I brought him up. John didn't bring him up. I brought him up and said, there's a kid from Wisconsin as well who's going to Iowa State and Milan Monsilovich. And he was like, oh, yeah, Milan can hoop. And I was like, I agree. He's going to have a good year. Fast forward, Big 12 preview pods of Res Ball. Res. I talked about him. And I said, you know, this kid for Iowa State, like they brought in Jackson Popleski. They brought in Keyshawn Gilbert. They have a lot of returners, especially oh, in the front court. You, who's not um, looked great so far. Yeah. And they brought in Omaha Bill. But it's like the guy that I thought was going to be the best. Um, you know, I thought Omaha was going to win freshman of the year, but yeah, like, looks like it's going to be actually might be Milan, Milan Monsilovich. I'm going to change my prediction right now to Milan being freshman of the year. Um, the Fran Franchilla, if you don't know, Julian didn't, but a uh, longtime bas- college basketball analyst dubbed him Baby Dirk, and I think you know through the first game, if you look at you know, my Twitter on on the clock basketball, you look at the edit that I made from him from his first game, had a phenomenal NCAA debut. I'm sure it ranks up there with some of the best all time in terms of efficiency and shooting volume. Um, But through his first two games, uh, I'll save the question or the comment at the end um, that Fran Franchilla made. It was on Twitter, Um, 35 points, 11 rebounds, two assists, two steals and blocks in 57 minutes. Nine for fourteen from two point range. I mean, if you for a six foot eight freshman, if you if you look at some of the threes he's taking as well, there is no movement. It's movement shooting movement threes. It's like it's passing high and going off and 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 you know kind of fading to the corner off screens. Um, and then now in the second game, he's getting dubbed Baby Dirk by Fran Franchilla because he's hitting turnaround jumpers. He's doing, he did a lot, and he, he's. Looks like he's showing a diverse offensive ballot, which I think is impressive for two games against nothing teams. But still, it's it's not what we were expecting. I don't. He think looks great for Iowa State. He, I think that really Iowa does. State's a real team. Um, you know, we had them. Um, unranked. No, we no, we had them at twenty six. Did we have them ranked? Yeah, we had them at twenty six. Because we're smart. Right, I forgot we ranked. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Is what I should pay attention. This really should be in uh mid-major um performers. Would you, would you but, guess, but but okay. I think they're both legitimate draft prospects, and I think that this is gonna be the bottom out because I think these guys showed me the biggest like stock rise. I think that these two sophomores for Belmont, Kate Tyson, Malik Dia, are gonna come in and fill the Ben Shepherd role wholeheartedly in terms of the scoring load for Belmont and adds add ample to it. Um, Malik Dia in his first game for Belmont, 24 points, four rebounds, four steals and blocks in 27 minutes, 10 for 15 from the field. It's the efficiency for the two of them. The efficiency is ridiculous. That's that's why I'm so high on them. Cade Tyson had 29 points, three rebounds on 12 shots, 29 points on 12 Shots, nine for 12 from the field, five for seven from three. I'm just the craziest freaking looks that you'll ever see. Like he's f- catching the ball, fading off the screen. Uh, front fades, if you like 2K, shout out to 2K front fades. Mm-hmm. He's greening that. See, I didn't I didn't get the opportunity to watch Belmont yet or dub into the Belmont film. So I'm looking forward to it. Malik I, Diaz a freak, bro. I, I mean, get... he's dunking on people. He's hitting turnaround jumpers. Like rhythm turnaround jumpers, like all net, like like he like he's shooting these all day, and I'm sure he is because he's adding this element to his game. Took two three point shots in that game, two of his misses were from three, and it just tells me like, hey, he is shooting these shots, like he is a capable shooter. He wants to take these shots. Jumper looks great. 
Um, he could shoot a little bit last year, especially from mid range, but now he looks like a totally revolutionary, revolutionized player. And Belmont looks legit. They have a one, two punch that I think rivals a lot of really good teams in the country and their team going forward. Once they start getting some good wins under their belt, they especially did, they did lose today. I think once they start getting some more good wins under their belt, yeah. they're going to be a team to watch out for. Yeah, they're in that NBC. <laughs> they're in that NBC, baby. Dude, the NBC, the NBC uh, it's, conference the breakdown looks it. so good now because of how much talent is looking like it's going to be in exactly. the NBC this year. And we talked about both these guys. Um, previewing the next week, we're you've been around here before. We pick five games. Every week. I pick five games every week. Julian picks five games for us to watch Thank every you. week. And uh, we go through and make our predictions. Um, and then we will keep track of our records, respectively, all season. And then we will also keep track of whenever we have guests on. Um, as this will be the primary podcast now on the six month or on the on the clock basketball podcast feed on Spotify and YouTube. Um, you know, we're kind of drifting away from the war room stuff. Um, and some of the other work, just random podcasts that we've been doing, obviously, now that the college basketball season started, and this is what we're really invested in. Yeah, we kind of have work to do, but Yeah, we got work to do. So, you know, we're going to focus on bringing the guests on here now, um, you know, kind of like we were doing the previews. But, you know, it's once a week, um, we may have a guest, we may not. I'm going to work on trying to get higher end guests for everybody, um, for everybody's sake, because I think it's more interesting to ask you know, high end people to pick games, especially games that they may have stake in. Um, whether it's a college basketball player, whether it's a college basketball assistant coach, whether it's a college basketball head coach. We do not endorse picking games that you're playing in. Yeah, we won't. We won't. We won't. We won't, <laughs> we won't make them pick games that they're playing in, but we will make them pick games that are within their own conferences if we can. Ooh, yeah. I like that. Yeah, even if it's like some like guy from the NBC or something. Put them under fire. Yeah, put them under fire and make them pick like the pick, make them pick between two rival schools. <laughs> um, but for this week, um, we got on November 14th, we have a nice slate of games um coming up on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, which would be tomorrow, as these are gonna go up on Mondays this year, um, relative to Wednesdays last year. We have our number 29, Michigan State taking on number seven. Uh, again, these are our rankings. Get over yourself. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. Number 29, Michigan State versus number seven, Duke. You know what's funny? Yes. Is one of our teams in the rankings is going to be one and two. Yes, I know. <laughs> these, are the, these are two I was just three, processing two, that. Two of the three one and one teams. That's that so funny. I didn't I didn't even think about that when I put the game in there. Um kind of the narrative behind this game is that we have um two players um that kind of play similar positions Cohen card didn't have a really notable first couple games uh, for michigan state games. but he had a really really sneaky debut against james madison yeah, um put up 14 points and just as a high effort high energy player reminds me a little bit of cam whitmore if cam whitmore maybe didn't have the expectations that he had yeah. um mark mitchell obviously a heralded college player at this point in my opinion um, had a phenomenal year last year for Duke. He had a tough game against Arizona, though. His jumper doesn't look great. No, it's tough. It is. Uh, I was expecting maybe a bigger jump. It is like Kyrie believes the earth is, which is flat. A little bit flat. I'll let it slide because we're talking about Duke. Huh. Kyrie wins, Duke. Oh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I intended that. That was the full, that was the full intent. All right, all right, all right. We have, speaking of backcourt players for Duke, oh, that's we a, have Tyrese Proctor and Jared McCain. That's an exciting backcourt. Um, also, as well as Jeremy Roach, taking on the experienced backcourt of Tyson Walker, Jay Nakins, and A.J. Hogard. Um, three-guard lineups, three-guard three guard three Monty, guard Monty you call it. And I, I love that term. Um, and then we also have Xavier Booker, who is hopefully going to get more run as the season goes on. Um, I'd say more Monty Sissoko. Yeah, I, um, let me let me explain that because I could have put Monty Sissoko down, but I want the uh, fans to get excited about two former five-star recruits battling it out. So yeah, said these are Booker. called top prospect matchups for a reason. Um, and even though Akins and Walker and Hogart are all included on our sheet. And- <laughs> 
But um tell that to the haters. I didn't say anything. <laughs> it's Kyle Filipowski versus Xavier Booker. Um a good matchup. I'll be excited to see kind of athleticism versus skill. Um, some would say, but Booker's got a Booker's got a solid game. Um, he's not afraid to take it on the perimeter. I'm not afraid to uh, make a step out so he can blow past you and uh, and meet you at the rim. So nice. Yeah, it's well said. Yeah, thanks. Uh, then we have Marquette, Illinois. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. versus Cam Jones. Uh, the two high volume scorers um, for those two universities. Um, you know, kind of a little uh, Midwest rivalry. Um, what are your thoughts about this one, Julian? Oh, this one's fun, man. I mean, we should actually pick the games. Are Are we gonna? I was gonna say, are we going through all the games and then we'll, we'll pick, pick we'll pick, time? we'll pick Duke, Michigan State first. All right, I'm gonna take Michigan State. Well, I'm gonna take Duke. So we have our first disagreement on the first pick of the uh, season. Do Do we have to explain our picks? Yeah, go ahead. Look, um, Caleb knows this, but I'm going to say it for my lovely fans who probably are missing the board right now. Duke has two things. Shout out, Trevor. Shout out, Trevor. Duke has two things I don't like. Ryan Young and John Shire. Michigan State has one thing I like. Tom Izzo. Oh, they also have Cone Car. That's it. That's all it is. It's very simple. I'm I'm doing uh, mathematical equations. Two plus two equals Michigan State. And then, you know what? I'm picking Duke because um, I think they're more talented. And I think that Proctor is um, – if Proctor continues to play like he has been, McCain's I've been pleasant. He's been good. And I think that, um, you know, if it turns into a front court battle – I don't like necessarily Duke in the game, um, but I will live with my selection. I just – I think they're a more talented team at the end of the day. I think it's – Five points on the bench does not tell me that they're a more talented team. I'm just saying. And that's what happened for Arizona. I hear it. I hear it. And I just – I think Duke's going to win this one. I like Duke over Michigan State. I think that John Shire has a fire lit under his ass. Didn't we say that last year? And what happened? They got blown up by Tennessee in the second round. I think John Shire's going to fire lit under his ass. <laughs> I doubled down on my statement. On the direct statement, I doubled down. Um, I'm taking Duke over Michigan State, um, almost for the sake of just being – I don't know, difficult, I guess. It's uh, despite me. It is despite you completely. I, you know what? I'll take a spite pick because it means that I'm going to win. Generally, I would I would assume that's what's going to happen, especially in my case, how things have been going with me lately. <laughs> um, I mean, I can't win a freaking game in fantasy basketball, and it is the most excruciating thing ever. But I am in the tank, openly in the tank. So, um, you know, shout out to our Dynasty League. Shout out to Steven um, Beckham and the One and Done podcast. I'm also in the tank, man. It's a... Speaking of in the tank, let's not talk about ranked teams. Just kidding. We're going to talk about ranked teams like Marquette, Illinois. Number 10 to number 11. We have almost a top 10 battle. We will get to a top five battle in Dude, a moment. Um, week two, we have a top five battle. Are we picking uh are we picking Marquette Illinois first? Yeah, obviously we talked about the two high scoring guys in Terrence Shannon Jr. and Cam Jones. I think there's a lot of other great players. Obviously, we have Coleman Hawkins versus Oso Yadaro. Um oh, we that. have John Gibbs Lawthorne, um, who's been getting minutes versus um Tyler Colick. Um I'm excited. This is uh, a fun one, man. I'm excited. I'm gonna take Marquette. Yeah, I am too, actually. Duh. I was I was thinking about taking Illinois. I just like this this early in the season, especially. Like I don't think Illinois' backcourt is fully like figured out outside of Terrence Shannon Jr. yet. Um and like Kolick and Cam Jones are phenomenal. Like I'm I'm gonna go with the more reliable backcourt in this case. And I think Ty Rogers, shout out Ty Rogers. Ty Rogers is a great player. I just I 
I trust in those two guards so much because um, they were they are phenomenal players. Yeah, I don't know. For me, I think this game's going to come down to I think um, Marquette is just in a better spot offensively. Um, I think that they have their offensive system figured out where Illinois hasn't really determined yet if they're going to play through Dane Danger at all. Um, and I think once they make that decision, likely that they're going to play through Dane Danger a good bit more. Yeah, I um, that. Then I think that they'll start to be a more dominant team, especially in the interior. Um, but with Coleman Hawkins, you just never know. Kid could drop 20 on any night. Taron Shannon Jr. could drop 45 on any night, um, which for college basketball is like 60. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it'll be interesting. Um, it'll be a fun game. I have a hard time picking that one because uh, my heart's my heart's in it for both teams. Um, now we're looking at number four, Kansas, versus number five, Kentucky. How did they know this is the game that we wanted? Um, I'm going to take Kentucky. I'm struggling with this one. Talk me through it. I want to hear your reasoning. Um, I think Kentucky is in a spot where they're going to play um, with a lot of pace, hopefully. Um, I like the things that I've seen um, from their youngsters. Um, Reed Shepard's played well. Um, I think it'll be an interesting game to see him and Johnny Furphy out there uh, playing against each other because they're both very similar prospects and, and certain lenses. Um, I just think that, that, you know, Kansas is a great squad, but I think that Kentucky's just got a little bit more grit to them. Um, you know, obviously we haven't really seen what the, what their guard rotation really is going to flesh out to be. Um, you know, obviously with Reeves, um, Reeves, uh, Wagner, Dillingham, Wagner, Dillingham, 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 Edwards, Edwards. Um, it's a bit of a mess. It's a bit of a mess, but I still think that they're in a spot where um, depth is going to be a good thing, especially in an early season matchup versus a Kansas team. Um, you know, where they haven't really quite figured out where all Marco Jackson fits in the rotation. Obviously, Dewan Harris is a great player, but. I can't honestly. I can't wait to see the two offensive powerhouses of DJ Wagner and Rob Dillingham take on the number one defensive guard in the entire country, Dewan Harris. I just for I don't know. Like I do believe in Kansas to an extent. Um, I just I can't get behind. I'm stri- I'm strictly like I'm I'm between them. Like I'm like think that Kansas has the front court matchup advantage. Yeah, um, Governor Dickinson. Yeah. And I don't think Kentucky's really got an inside presence at this point. Um, I mean, is it, has Visage been playing? I haven't really I mean, seen Visage hasn't even been cleared to play. When is he cleared to play? Exactly. Oh, Jesus. Man. On yes, it was obviously, yeah. um, you know, been hard with, out with injuries, and Bradshaw hasn't played. Uh, did they have Thierry back at least? Thierry was, yeah, Thierry was playing. Okay. Um, and then that hurt yesterday. you know, who's their other front court player? I'm blanking. I feel like it's like it's going to be like it hit me in the front of like face moment. I'm, I'm um, blanking on it too, man. Uh, it's I'm, been a long night and it's been a lot of basketball this weekend. I know it's in Yenso. I know they got uh, they have Bradshaw, Bradshaw they have a visage. Um, do they have anyone else? <laughs> do they really? Um, dude. It's it's like probably some sort of fourth year play that we're not gonna know. Well, we should know. Yeah, I know. Um, I, they haven't played anyone this year. I like I'm not gonna watch Kentucky beat like, you know, Arkansas State by 45. I'm sorry. Sorry, podcast listeners, you're gonna have to wait for a sec. Um, you know what? I'll just talk through it. I'm gonna take Kentucky as well. Um. They don't really have one. I told you. They have Jordan Burks, who's been playing. Um, they don't have one. Yeah, I mean, they don't really – like, Jordan Burks has been playing a good bit. Ogana Onyesu is going to have to play um, if he's healthy. Um, so you're telling me they have no answer to Hunter Dickinson? That's a sign. I'm picking Kansas. <laughs> you know what that siren means? It's an emergency. You didn't add those two LaSalle players. You didn't add their uh, names. I will add them at some point. Hmm. Um, but just I got sidetracked out of ADHD. Uh, nice. But uh, moral of the story, I'm taking Kentucky or Kansas. I'm sorry. 
I who's it, like if if someone can tell me who stops Hunter Dickinson, please in the comments let me know. I would love to eat, to know something about who's going to stop him before I find out on what what night is it? The seventeenth Tuesday. I don't have an answer for you, um, but I think that I'm going to play devil's advocate and stay with my pick. I, I think you made a great point. Um, and I think I've, I proved the point for us both by going into this spreadsheet. <laughs> and I think that there's no doubt that this is going to be an interesting game for the Kentucky front court. Aduthiero is going to have to guard Hunter Dickinson. Bro, Aduthiero, Justin Edwards, like one. <laughs> Aduthiero six eight now. One fronting, one like guarding behind in the post. They'll Just... stick Rob Dillingham on his back. And I think they'll have, <laughs> I think they'll have Aduthiero pick him up at half court. Sure, we'll we'll go with that. That works. Kentucky by seven. <laughs> Kentucky by seven. Um, then now we're moving on to the twentieth, um, which is Saturday, I believe. Um, Sunday, Saturday, Saturday. Well, no, it's um, Monday actually. Oh, this is for next Monday. This is next oh, Monday bad. before we record. Before we record, yeah. On Monday, or maybe one of these games will be during. We'll have to yeah, UCLA the one will definitely UCLA will definitely be during. Yeah. Um, but we'll have to see. We'll be able to keep tabs on it and update you guys as we're going through who wins that. Um, we might even push the recording until like the end of towards the end of the game oh, or good. even after, uh, just so we can yell at each other about the pick. Cause I feel like we might differ in opinion on that one. Um, but we'll have to see when we get there. I First, know. we have Purdue versus Gonzaga, number 18 versus number 14. Quite literally um, a big game. Yeah, a big game. Um, we're not, we're open, uh, Zach E.D. haters. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, can we just, uh, talk about how on the Big Ten MVC doc, there was a specific note that I did not see before I made my picks. Um, so I made my pick for player of the year. I made my pick for first team. And then I read the note underneath the, uh, doc that said no Zach E.D. And I had to. Uh, make a little bit of a swap. I, it's he's just tall. I'm sorry, Zach. Like you're probably a nice kid. I think you're Canadian. He is Canadian. Um, but you're just tall, bro. I'm sorry. I, I'm picking Gonzaga. I have no faith in. Purdue. I'm picking Purdue. Um, because I believe in the tall Canadian to win basketball games. I don't believe in him to entertain me in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. I don't think they're gonna win big games. Um, I don't think this. Wait, wait, wait! Stop! I don't think that this is. A, I don't think this is a big game. Okay, I, it's, I it's think a ranked matchup. Graham Ek is not going to be able to stop Zach Eady. Fairly Dickinson stopped Zach Eady. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I mean if Watson has a good game, Hickman has a good game. What about like what about this Purdue team? Honestly, okay, I I know we're Foster just, lawyer has been but, great. Like, what about this Brain Brain right now has been great. What about oh. this Purdue team is better than the Purdue team that lost to Fairleigh Dickinson? Like, what are they going to do differently if they if like Gonzaga just says screw? I think they have the team. experience of losing to Fairleigh Dickinson. Are their guards just magically better? Is like that that was going to happen? Like magically, they know how to throw the lob passes that you now. Well, I think that they. I mean, we can look at the synergy stats if we want to, but I think the post touches are definitely going to be there for Zach Eady this year. I mean, they played against a terrible team. I say I said that ironically because they were there last year. They're there every year. <laughs> He's seven foot five. I'm still picking Purdue. I think that there's nobody on Gonzaga that can stop them. I think it will take a very specific type of team to stop Purdue this year. I think they're a touch better. I'm still not a believer, though, and Zach Eady will never be an NBA draft prospect, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, so Zach Eady's so far for today. Number 17, we were hinting at before because the last game was so entertaining for me. Um, number 17, UCLA versus number 10, Marquette. Second Marquette game on our slate. I love it. They eat it up, and I'm assuming Julian put it on there to make it tough for me. Um, uh, no, I picked the only five good games for this week. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was close to picking against Marquette in the first one, and now – I'm going to pick against Marquette in this one. I don't think that there's anybody on that roster for Marquette that can stop a Dempona. Um, and then when you combine the fact that, you know, UCLA hasn't looked great by any means, but they're getting a Dimara into the fold. 
Theo Bell is getting into the fold. I'm sure Burke will get into the fold. Vida is getting into the fold. And they still have Andrews. And they still have all this talent. Lazar Stefanovic had a rough night last night. He's terrible. Um, you, you just despise him. But I think he's a really good player. Good. Um, I just don't think he's like. And I love Marquette. I love Marquette basketball. Tyler Kolick is our is our uh, banner this year on Twitter. It was Grady Dick last year. Um, and now it's Tyler Kolick. Shout out white blonde players. Uh, Tyler Kolick has brown hair, bro. Dirty blonde. I'm pretty sure he has brown hair. Dirty blonde. All right, whatever. We'll do it with it. But, um, dude, UCLA was – that is brown. Get it's out dirty of here. Blonde. That is brown. Anger. Dirty blonde. We should make a we should make a poll after the pod. Awesome. What color is Tyler – what color is Tyler – what color is Tyler Cole? That's a hard thing to say. Right, it's brown hair. But um, I was trying to stick to something. I guess I just didn't want it to be just white player. Can we just go with players that would look like me slightly if I had hair? I mean, me. I'm a better looking version of you with hair. <laughs> I didn't say better looking. I'm better looking than Tyler Cole. Um, but I'm not making it about appearance. I'm making it strictly about basketball. Look, I'm a better point guard than Tyler. Dude, I'm I'm gonna be honest about this game. I was I thought you were gonna say I'm gonna be honest. You're not a better play guard than Tyler <laughs> Cole. <laughs> it's implied. Um, I was not impressed with UCLA last night. I think they're still figuring it out. I don't think that. Yeah, he's typing Marquette because you know they're gonna pick Marquette. I just don't think they have it like all together yet. I don't think Chris Mack knows what his rotations fully look like yet. He's kind of just like throwing lineups out there and hoping that something sticks to the wall. And I think he's going to be doing a lot of that against Marquette. Um, and I just don't. Who did I, who did I say he's their coach? Chris Mack. I always mix up the two ball dudes. I'm so sorry. I love you to death. Um, I just, I'm sorry, man. Like the thing about, uh, Shaka Smart's another ball guy who I'm picking to win this game. Um, I just like last night when we were, when I was watching UCLA, they had like first they threw Mara and Bone out there with all with like V Day and Stefanovic and Sebastian Mack. And then they threw out like Dylan Andrews and Feeway and like Sebastian Mack and uh Nuoba and uh, who's and Bone. Like they were just throwing these like it just seemed like they didn't really they didn't have, have a strategy of how they're going to score the basketball consistently and what players were going to help facilitate. No, it kind of was like, okay, we're going on a run. Let's stick with this five and okay. And that's kind of what happened Um, is like the Bonamara thing didn't really work. They were losing. Chris Mack got tired of it. And then eventually they were like, you know what? Fine. Like we have a five that's playing good defense. We're going to stick with that for now. Maybe that's the five they go with on Monday. I have no idea. Like, it's just too many moving parts for me right now. And like we've taught, we just talked about it with Marquette. Like they're a known entity. We, they know what they are. Like we know what they are. And I think that that early in the season, that wins more. Valid. Completely like valid. Long winded way of saying that. Yeah. It was a long winded way of saying that Marquette is just better at this point, better coached than um, you shall. I, you could have just cut me off and said Marquette's better coached than. But I kind of, I kind of like the rambling, and I switch back to Zoom, and I'm like, you know, I'm just appreciating the fact that we're, uh, we're chilling here, just me and you. That's in great, person. dude. Um, That's fucking yeah. yeah, good, good in person pod, first one ever, and last one for a while, unfortunately. Um, but we will catch you guys soon, back from separate rooms. We're ending this Zoom. We're off the clock. We're off the clock.